Um, okay, welcome to this um, session, uh, which I'm going to be welcoming Ivan Neumann. The the idea here is this is a this is not a super formal session. It's meant to be an op opportunity for a conversation. It's a kind of oh, I should say by the way, does everybody know who I am? I'm Jacinta Hagen. I'm the director of the Grad Centre in Governance and International Affairs. So I think I know most people, but maybe not everyone. So welcome to the Grad Centre. Um, this is one of the occasional series where we have distinguished scholars. We invite them in to have a chat about how they do their work, what kind of methods, what kinds of approach, how do they develop their projects. Because many of you are in that space right now, or have been in that space, or have just moved out of that I'm space. I'm in that space. You're in that space. I think we're always in that space. Mm -hmm. So many of you have already had the pleasure of listening to Ivor and his other presentations. We've been working him very hard while he's been here I at UQ. So, really. No, okay. I'm a professor, remember? Okay, yeah. that's true. <laughs> so Ivor is a professor at UP in Oslo, the Norwegian. Uh, Institute for Foreign Policy, and he's the outgoing professor, Monica Montague Burton Professor at the London School of Economics. Um, he's well known to many of you. He, he crosses boundaries in IR, he writes on social theory, he writes fantastic work on diplomacy, Russian and uh, Norwegian foreign policy, and historical sociology. Yeah, uh, historical international relations. Sorry. That's a little bit uh, more. He's going to talk to us today about relating to um, his uh, recent work, I think, on discourse analysis. He's just produced a book with uh, Kevin Dunn out of uh, the US on that. And um, he's going to be speaking freely because his son's got his iPhone with his notes on it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I can't believe so I did that. These things happen. He said, you know, can I share your internet? Yeah. I was sort of stupid as I am, just gave him my phone. <laughs> And uh, with the notes on. But you know, I've been researching this for 30 years. So if I'm not able to produce something for you, it's not really worth my salt. So, so this will be my manuscript. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's that thing that we should do more of. It's the how to book. Really. Yes, yes. I mean, everyone in IR is talking about meta theory, they're talking about theory, they're talking about methodology. But I think we should talk more about method. Mm. And by method, I simply mean ways to produce data. Because data is not something that is there for the taking, it's something you have to produce. It's a result of a social process. And the more you know about the social process, the better you mm. So I've been asked to talk about one particular kind of data, which is uh, a, a produ production of data, and is, that is how you produce data for a discourse analysis. So what I will do is I will talk a bit about what discourse, what where discourse analysis comes from, because there is still, after f well, after almost 50 years, there's still this idea that discourse analysis is something very new, mm. which is I think absolutely wrong. It's simply wrong. Discourse analysis is a prolongation of certain other ways of producing data. And uh, then I will say a little bit about how to do discourse analysis, hands-on. I will touch on practice theory, which is for some reason now the cat's whiskers in IR. And in, in other social fields, it's been an ongoing concern mm -hmm. like 30, 40 years. So we, as usual, we late to the ball. Right? So, and before I start, I will simply say what discourse is to me. Discourse is a way of producing statements. It is what makes it possible to come out with an utterance that people take seriously as a truth claim. Uh, so it's the system that makes it possible. If I had had a gl glass of water here, it's what would have made it possible for me to sprinkle it around and say, receive God's blessing because some kind of water can do that. Or it's what would have made it possible for me to say, as a medical doctor, I can tell you that this water has just emerged from a womb, and let's see now, it's a boy. I don't know whether you can do that, but, but it is what can take any kind of utterance, and by utterance I mean a, the spoken utterance, or I mean a, an icon, or a picture, or a gesture, a sign, basically. Semio, semios, you know, it's a semiology kind of thing. And here comes the key thing that people get wrong. 
a number of people get wrong. The previous, a lot of people in the previous generation never wanted to understand this. This course is not the utterances taken together. It's not the utterances as such. It's what makes it possible to produce the utterances, which is very different. So it's the system uh, that makes it possible for, for me, for example, to say that uh, Cindy is a great intellectual. No one will bet nine if I say Cindy is a great intellectual. If this had been 200 years ago and I said Cindy is a great intellectual, it would have come across as well, a joke, mm. irony. Mm. This, of course, a woman who can't be an intellectual. Right? And certainly not a great intellectual. Um, so it's the system that makes it possible to come up with a claim that is taken seriously as a truth claim. Um, that's what it is. So, part one. Where does this come from? There is a sense in which you can find uh, the same kind of thrust that discourse analysis does in the annal school, the historical school. If you look at people like Brodel, they are trying to find the general social setups that make it, makes it possible to do something specific. You know, his idea of a long durée is about this, right? You will have certain conjunctures that makes it possible to do certain specific things. But that's a long shot. The key thing here is that Brodel and the Annals School is French. I would argue that discourse analysis comes straight out of the French tradition. And my argument goes like this. I'll go back. The concept of discourse and discourse analysis comes out in the book Archaeology of Knowledge by Michel Foucault, which it published in 1970. And that book was written by Foucault when he was on sabbatical in Tunisia. And he took that sabbatical because he was exhausted after having produced his previous book, which was a huge seller. It sold 100,000 copies on the general French market. It was called Les Mots et les Choses. In, in, in English, it's not called Words and Things because that title had been taken by Austin. So it's called uh, The Order of Things. Isn't that what it's called? Yeah. And what Foucault did in that book was to talk about what he called an episteme. That is from epistemic, right? From, from epistemology, from how you know that things, how you know how things can be known, as it were. Uh, and the epistemy he looked at was how the 18th century produced ways of seeing and ways of knowing. And his major finding was that you know, 18th century thought of everything as symmetry. So what he did on this sabbatical in Tunisia was to uh, ask something that, and you know, I take heart from this. Only after he produced the book, he asked himself, what the heck did I do in that book? And I speak now to the doctoral students amongst you, but also my colleagues. I don't know about you, but I've now finished something like 30 projects. There's always been a point, short or long, where I've asked myself, what the f am I doing here? You know, what, what is this? You know, I have this question, but it's not the right question. You know, I need another question. And I'm not really answering what I, does this sound at all familiar? <laughs> this is, to me, the nature of research, right? And Foucault <coughs> asked himself this post-factum, you know, what did I do? And what he had done, of course, was that he had broken with the people that he'd been hanging with so far, the structuralists. He had, and the, structural, the, the, the <coughs> gist of structuralism, how many people in this room call themselves post-structuralists? Okay, only me, right? Uh, thanks, Mark. I will remember that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, jump the train. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, structuralism was predicated on one very specific idea. And it was that there's a difference between <coughs> manifest structures and latent structures. Manifest structures would be how cooking goes on in a specific social setting or how the division of gendered labor works in a specific setting, a manifest structure that you can observe, you can break it down to a binary code, one, zero, right? and you have the structure. So the analysis is you look at how food is made, 
and you say that's the raw, that's the cooked, that's the rotten, you draw up sort of a certain structure, and you say, okay, here is the manifest structure, here we have a lot of sort of observable sort of data, and we can sort of, we can put it on a formula and call it a manifest structure. And the point of that again, that was a goal in itself, but it was also a goal towards a further goal, which was to say, if we have enough Manifest, manifest structures observed and accounted for in a society, we may go from those manifest structures and to the underlying structure which determines these observable manifest structures. And that is the latent structure. So the whole point of social theory is to do a lot of manifest structures and then infer back to the latent structure that holds it all together and is the master code of a society. This is, of course, the program of Claude Lévi-Strauss. Right? Claude Lévi-Strauss had it... Well, I'll come back to that. But, you know, Foucault's step, and he was not alone in this in 67. People like Lyotard were doing the same thing. They asked one simple question. What if there is no latent structure? What if manifest structure is all there is? That was a treacherous question to ask for a, structure, for a structuralist. Claude Lévi-Strauss never understood the question. He said, you know, what? Of course there is a latent structure. He lived to be almost 100. Or did he around 100? Um, he died a couple of years ago. And, you know, he never sort of abandoned his structuralism. So post-structuralism is simply the break with the idea that there is such a thing as a latent structure and that we should use our intellectual energy on finding that latent structure. Which means two things. A, um, post-structuralism is different because it, there is a sense in which it's, it stays on the surface. And B, post-structuralism is also a structuralism because it grows out of structuralism, so it belongs to the structural family. The fact that it comes after post-structuralism does not mean that it's not a structuralism because it's still one zero, still sort of finding the manifest structures. But... Foucault's question to himself in Tunisia, how did I do this, what did I do in, in the order of things, was that he needed some idea of what could not be observed, how things were produced. But he needed some idea of how this could be thought of without being as cast in stone as a latent, as a latent structure would be. So what is it that is possible to, makes it possible to produce manifest structures, basically? And his answer to this question was... Discourse, of course. That's where the idea of discourse comes from. So discourse is simply a system for produ the production of statements. Now, if we go further back, we do a sort of mini genealogy here, uh, you will see that Claude Lévi-Strauss was inspired by two different things you know, in drawing up structuralism. One of them was Ferdinand de Saussure's idea of language. Right? Ferdinand de Saussure was a Swiss, well, he was a, from Geneva, and he had this um, amazing thing where he looked at language and said, you know, since Aristotle, everyone had thought about lo language as referential. You know, I see a horse, and then there is the idea of horse. Right? So if one of them refers to the other, that's what language is about. Language is a transparent, uh, should be a transparent system by saying sort of uh, where, the, uh, where the word refers to the thing, right? The signifiant and the signifier, the signifier and the signified. Right? Now, what Saussure says is two, uh, two, two basic things. He says, language can be thought of not as a referential, but as relational. Instead of thinking of language as something that refers to things, we could think of language as a closed system of binary oppositions. Cat and bat, what we now call phonemes, right? We can think of language as, as a system that is closed in and upon itself, where we know that cat is different from bat, because C is different from B, and they are phonemes. They, they, it means that they can differentiate between words. 
If you know a foreign language, you know that this can be done in very many different ways. T and T, for example, can be, or in Chinese, you can have tonemes. There are different ways of doing this, but the entire idea is that Saussure thinks about language differently than people had thought before. He thinks of language as a closed binary system that is self-referential, if you like, that is relational. Right? That was an inspiration for Lévi-Strauss. The other inspiration for Lévi-Strauss was the anthropologist and sociologist Marcel Mauss. Marcel Mauss, if you look at what he was doing, he was interested in classifications. Marcel Mauss was also the uh, son of Emile Durkheim's daughter and the collaborator of Durkheim. So, and Durkheim is just about as close you can, as you can get to a founding father of sociology in, in the French tradition. Of all the social sciences, really, they didn't care if you called it political science or anthropology or sociology in those days. You know, it was basically understanding society at large. Durkheim's pr professor, professorial chair was in pedagogics, for heaven's sake. Um, and Durkheim was trying to do, when, and also Durkheim and Morse were trying to do things with categories. You know? The key thing was you look at something and it makes little sense if you can't categorize it. It drives me up the wall when I have students, usually first year bachelor students, saying that, but you can't do that because you will verify it. What the you can't look at anything without reifying it, right? If I look at you, or you, or you, uh, I will take certain ideas, categories, and make sense of you. And if I hadn't had those categories, the whole thing would have been a blur. Right? You need categories in order to comprehend the world, in order to grasp the world. So without categories, you can't grasp the world. Right? And if you look at Durkheim's Methods book from 1898. You will see that he talks about things like social fact. That, you know, what we do as social scientists is look at a specific category of facts that do not exist as things, uh, sorry, which do not exist as material things, but exist because we think they're there. Money would have been an obvious example, right? And Morse was doing more stuff with this. The two of them wrote together wrote a book called Primitive Classification, which is absolutely marvelous. The point is that primitive classification tries to make everything add up to the same. For example, astrology would be a good example. That the astrological system, if you understand that the world in an astrological way, everything hangs together. If you look at the constellation of the stars, you look at what you eat, you look at uh, who does what in society, and all of them are related to the same system. Now, doesn't all this ring a bell? Isn't this very similar to saying that there are different latent structures and you're looking for a, a, a sorry, different manifest structures and you're looking for a latent structure? Isn't the idea of a social fact very much the same idea as a representation? What's the difference between what Durkheim calls a social fact and what Foucault calls a representation? That was supposed to be a rhetorical question. And Durkheim says in his book you know, that the first rule of method is to consider a social fact a thing. Our shores and the key. Sort of, he picks this word because it's an everyday word. So in the French tradition, it's no big deal that we're talking about representations of the social. They've always been doing it. And you can go further back. You can always go further back. Durkheim learnt his philosophy from a guy called Amelin, and Amelin was the major student of Charles Renouvier, who was the Third Republic's greatest philosopher. And his take on these things was very simple. He said, anything, any, any phenomenon has an inside and an outside. This, book, this table, for example, it has an inside. You know, thank you. <laughs> it also has an outside. It's quite obvious when you look at this table that it's not something that belongs in a drawing room. Right? Um, this book has an inside. It also has an outside. It's quite clear that it's not a novel. Simply by picking it up, you see that it's not a novel. And then Renouvier says, materialism is to exaggerate the importance of the inside of the thing. 
Idealism is to exaggerate the importance of the outsider. This is a little bit like Mao, isn't it? A left deviance is to stop a good thing too late, and a right deviance is to stop a good thing too early. Right? It's a very effective way of, of thinking about this. And you know, I hope you can see the line from the 1870s and Renouvier's way of thinking about phenomena, because the outside of the thing, isn't that what, what Durkheim is talking about when he talks about social facts? Isn't that representations? Um, so, the point I'm trying to get across is that discourse analysis stands smack dab in the middle of the French tradition, the French epistemological tradition. If you look at the people that Foucault read and refers to when it comes to these things, they're the standard French epistemologists working in this old tradition. Um, discourse analysis in terms of how to do it the <clears throat> key thing about discourse analysis is that you look at things from the inside of how people themselves are actually experiencing it the social factors it's not the analyst's idea of what the world looks like that you're after it's the idea of the people who are living the social reality you're interested in and their idea of a thing right? if you're interested in witchcraft you're not interested in sort of the analysis of the witchcraft from some outside point. You're interested in how these people who are thinking about witchcraft think about witchcraft. So if you study the Zande in the 1930s and 1940s, your interest is in these people thinking that witches, always females, have a certain stone in their intestines. Right? You're not interested in whether this is true or not. You're interested in how this way of, how this social fact, if this is a typical example of a social fact, witches have a stone in their intestines. Uh, and you're interested in where this comes from. How do people get to think this way? You're interested in how it works. How does this differentiate between people? And you're interested in the effects this will have. It means, for example, that if you're interested in, say, native conflict, you must understand witchcraft because conflict will be couched as a question of witchcraft for the Zander. Right? So, as an outside analyst, what do you do? I'd say, first, you need a cultural competence. When I did my study of how Russians represented, how Russia produced Europe historically, the first thing I needed to know was how, to, how the heck should I read the texts that they're producing? I needed the language, but I also needed their way of thinking about the world in general. I'll give you an example. In the Soviet period, when you wrote, when you wrote a text in a newspaper or wherever, you first had to reproduce the party line. And then there was one word that demonstrated to the reader that that was the end of the party line. Here starts the article. And that was Adnaka, which means however. Right? So, you know, it would be sort of Marx says this, Lenin said that, you know, and, you know, Brezhnev said this, however, comma, and then the argument would start. And it saved me oodles of time. I could skip the first part of those articles <laughs> with the party line and start reading. And I don't know whether this works this way in, 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 in nominal communist regimes these days, whether this works in Ethiopia or China, but, you know, I'm sure that you have similar things other, in other places. Uh, in the, if you read American texts, there are certain things that I, as a European, just sort of put to one side because I know that they don't really, it's not really important. It's take American films. You know, the film usually stops uh, 15 minutes after they should have stopped if there had been European films because they live happily ever after, right? <laughs> so, you know, you see the film and boom, there's the stop, and then they have a sort of, oh, and look how nicely everything goes, right? Um, and, you know, you, you need to know about these things, right? Because otherwise you, 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 you waste a lot of time. So the first thing is you need cultural competence to do a discourse analysis. And the second thing you need to do is establish a text corpus, which is very hard, because where does one does discourse stop and another one start? I mean, one of the key things is to find out that you re have to read from the inside, remember? You have to read how these people who are involved think about this. Whether you think that something is relevant or not is irrelevant. It's how the people you study think of it that's relevant. 
So if the people you study think that the constellation of the stars is important for understanding what will happen tomorrow, well, you goddamn have to get with the program and find out how that happens. Right? If you're doing Britain in the 1500s and you come across a, the expression a dog day afternoon, you have to know that it's a dog day afternoon because Sirius, the dog star, is standing close to the planet so that things will be hot. Right? And what is the what is the implication of that? Well, people will get short-tempered and things will happen and blah, 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 blah. You have to understand these things. And so, you know, you can't say, no. okay, let's make a discourse analysis of dogs in Kenya. And then you start with what a dog should signify in some other place. For example, the country you come from yourself. Then you screwed yourself over big time because that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for what a dog means in a specific Kenyan setting. So that's the second step. You have to somehow find the corpus of what is relevant to what. And I have two points to make there. One is interdiscursivity. Discourses always hang together with one another. Think about war and sports, for example. Where does war start and, 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 and sports begin? Very hard question. So you have to research it empirically. Uh, the other thing is you will usually find that certain texts or certain artifacts will be absolutely key to the discourse. Typically, if you do political stuff, white papers. Uh, do you have white papers in this country? Yeah. Yeah. White papers will be important. They will not necessarily be super important in a number of specific ways, but they will be important because a number of the people who debate these things will refer to them. Uh, if you study self-other relations, a key text will be Edward Said's book, Orientalism, because that opened the, that specific way of thinking. We call these texts monuments. Right? And you will immediately find them because when you open a couple of, when you look, read a couple of texts, they will refer to this stuff, or they will refer to stuff that refers to this stuff. So you will go da da da, right? And you will find the monuments. It's very important to know about these things. They are so often implied there is an intertextuality. Then the next step, so you establish a corpus, you, uh, you, um, you find the specific texts, and then the next step is you define the representations. It's very, very rare for a discourse to have only one representation of a phenomenon. Think male, for example. What does male mean in a certain specific social context? That is, I think I will dare to say, almost always contested. It's contested by class, ethnicity, age, you name it. So you find the different reps, and this is often the key thing for us who are interested in politics. You find the different ways of representing a phenomenon. Are transsexuals people who are mentally sick, are they a danger to the national security, or are they simply people who are in transition to something that feels better for them? These are three ways of representing the same phenomenon, and the political fight can be understood as a political fight of which of those three representations, or other representations, should be valid. Right? That's one way of understanding what politics is. Right? Regardless of whether you understand politics as who gets what, when, how, which is Paul Lazarsfeld's way of discussing it, or whether you understand politics as who we are, which I think is an alternative way of thinking about politics. So, you know, a specific representation will always be contested. When you've done that, you find the representations, and the key challenge there is how many representations? Because at first blush, you read all these texts and it looks like every single text has a specific representation of a phenomenon. You know, there was a point at which I almost literally cried in my beer over Russians talking about Europe. Because every Russian seemed to have his or her Europe. And how the heck should I get this down to a manageable size? And the key thing there is conflict as such. 
B.S. Naipaul wrote a novel, I think his best novel, called Gorillas. He had an epigraph saying that if everybody is warring everybody else, everybody's fighting everybody else, there is no war. Because then there's just chaos, then there's just anarchy. Politics is a structured thing where a couple of representations will stand against one another. Right? Is Donald Trump a savior or an idiot? Are we really interested in all the debates about his, hair, his hairdo? No, we're not really that. If we're interested in the politics, you know, we're interested in that debate as it feeds into the question of the, the wider representation of Trump as a political one. Right? So it's very rare to find a political scene where you have more than four or five major representations of the phenomenon, simply because politics works as conflict. And if for there to be conflict, there has to be some structured kind of conflict. There couldn't have been political parties at this point, really. So you have to find those representations, right? And this is where a number of people lose their nerves, because they say, oh, gee, there are 200 different representations here. I've read 200 texts, and you know, I can't get them to be two or three representations. Well, deal with it. <laughs> and then the last question to ask, I think, is uh, how quickly or how slowly do certain representations change? There are markers of every single representation has a number of ways of coming across socially that you can call diacritica, markers. Some of these markers, the people involved will be aware of themselves. Others they won't be aware of. Think class. Uh, in Britain, dropping your H's will be a typical class thing. So most people will not know that they've dropped their ages. They won't know the significance of this for other people who judge them and categorize them. Right? But there will be other things that they will be aware of. Right? Linguists are big on this. Markets that are used consciously and markets that, 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 that an analyst are using. Right? And the question then, you know, if you find representation that holds over 200 years, why the heck is that? Whereas other representations can, be, can change just like that. Right? Um, why is it? What is it that guarantees? And this is a question where, where sort of, um, where what Ernest Gellner calls entropy resistance. En entropy resistance is important. Think gender. Right? There's something about the physical here. This is where Judith Butler and I should have a discussion. Is everything about gender equally sort of malleable to social representations? Is everything about gender equally a social fact? Or are there certain ways of certain aspects of gender that can that are harder to change as a social marker than other aspects? Right? This is rather important issue. When I grew up, I was the only one in my first year of school class whose mother worked outside the home. It was a marker of femininity in my social area that the woman was at home working. That has certainly changed, but there are other markers of what it is to be a woman that have not changed in the same degree. For example, having kids. You can produce kids in laboratories. So you know there is nothing given, biologically given, about childbirth as a marker of femininity, as, in, as, as a universal marker. Is it as malleable as working at home? I ask the question. Judith would say they're equally malleable. I'm not so sure. Um, how are we doing in terms of time? Um, so we're going to wind up at one. So yeah, OK. I need three more minutes. Perfect. So this is what I did with my sort of career. You said that we should be your biographical, right? Oh, so this that. is what I did uh, in my work. And I, there came a point mm -hmm. when I was sick and tired of discourse analysis. Not because discourse analysis isn't nice, not because it's not important, but because of the underdetermining 
sort of character of discourse relative to action. When you know the discourse is inside out, you still don't know what's going to happen. Because action is always radically underdetermined by discourse. You can find the discourse, you can identify the representations, you can find out how quickly or how slowly they change. But if you're interested in what's going to happen, you scup it. You can say that it's much more likely that this will happen and that that will happen because the discourse will put down bookends to what is and what is not possible. So a discourse analysis is important for understanding political action as a precondition for action. But I came to a point where I said, okay, I'm sick and tired of preconditions of actions and now I want to study actions themselves. Which does not mean that that is more valid than the other thing. You know, I'm big on, on, on social form and if you're interested in social form, discourse analysis is super. But if you're also interested in outcomes, discourse analysis is not so great. You don't want to do discourse analysis if you want to find out what happened. Right? If you find out why there are regularities, why this happens so many times and this happens so few times, then discourse analysis is fine. But if you're interested in this specific situation, what happened? Discourse analysis is not necessarily what you want to. It's definitely, I mean, I try to tell this to my students. They come in, a number of them say, they want to study with me because they want to study discourse. And I say, so what are we interested in? Said, I'm interested in why this happened in 1984. I say, what does, I mean, you can't use discourse for understanding that. You have to. Open your toolkit, find something else. And my answer to that was practice analysis. Practices are discursive, meaning that a practice, you can define a practice as a socially recognized thing that can be done well or badly. Right? Um, playing tennis is a social practice. Uh, driving a car is a social practice. Delivering a speech is definitely a social practice. Giving a lecture is a social practice, etc., etc., etc. And these are all discursive in the sense that there is, there are a number of preconditions for how you can produce these practices. So the practices are, are coming straight out of discourses, if you like. Delivering a lecture is a very different thing in the Anglo world than it is in Russia, which is a different thing again from what it is to deliver a, Rush, a, a lecture in Germany. Most of you have heard a Frenchman give a lecture. If you're used to the Anglo way of giving lectures, you know, you sit there and you get to the point, right? Because they're always doing this sort of conceptual thing and hovering, 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 and hovering, and then if you're lucky, the hawk will come down in the last sentence or something. You know, at this point, you sort of board stiff, right? Because the Anglo tradition is that you tell people what you're going to do and what the point is, and then you unfold it. Right? So you know, and this is not that one is bad and one is 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 good. It's that these are different ways of getting across stuff to an audience. Right? Okay, so a practice is a socially recognized phenomenon that can be done well or badly. And they grow out of discourses. So my idea was that, you know, if you think of discourses as holding out stories about what to do. Discourses, for example, hold out subject positions for us to follow. Okay? Discourses are not idealist phenomena. The best article on this ever is a 1997 article by Mark here and uh, Ida Welders called Beyond Belief. They demonstrate the materiality of discourses. Uh, so they hold out stories for us to follow. If you're a good little student, you're supposed to do X, Y, Z. Right? If you're a successful bourgeois male, you're supposed to be X, Y, Z. Right? If you're a su successful mother, you're supposed to do X, Y, Z. You're supposed to do things like uh, letting your son have your telephone while he's doing a lecture for you. Because you want to be more stiff, right? At least I think so. Mm -hmm. I may have gotten this one wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so, Michel de Certeau says that you know, discourses hold out stories for us to follow. And I'd say that those stories that are held out are pra suggest practices. So discourses produce practices. We do the practices. And when we do the practices that we're supposed to do, like delivering a lecture on time, for example, we confirm the discourse. 
So most of the time, what we do confirm the social order at large and the specific discourse that we're in specifically. Because we follow the stories, we act out the stories in practices that we're being told to act out. And that, in turn, confirms the discourse. And, you know, I don't want to put any percentage on this because I'm not one person, but, you know, let's just say that almost all of the time we do this. It's very rare that we break with with what's going on. Has anyone of you sort of looked at ethno-methodology? You know, Garfinkel, that kind of thing? He used his students, he would tell sort of his female students, for example, don't smile. And then he would sort of hear what happened. So these women, who would be in their 20s, would go through the day without smiling. And they would come back to class and he said, what happened? And he said, it was terrible. I didn't fulfill the social expectation that I should smile all the time, so I quarreled with my boyfriend, I didn't get service in the restaurant, you know, I didn't act as I was supposed to do, so things went wrong. Another one he did was he said, go into a supermarket and start haggling. <laughs> <laughs> and you know the results were disastrous. <laughs> the police weren't called, but you know, Except for that, more or less everything happened. You know, people were thrown out, and there was yelling. You know. <laughs> of course there was. Right? Um, I spent a fair share of my time being a foreigner. And when you're a foreigner, you have this all the time. I mean, I've been in and out of Britain now for 40 years. I still feel like matter out of place. You know, I'll do things, and I know it's wrong, but no one will tell me what I'm supposed to do. Right? They keep you on tenter hooks, don't they? Right? And if you think that Australia is different, I can tell you it's not. You have this idea that everyone is mates, but, but you don't tell people what to do. So you do something wrong and everyone will stiffen, but they won't tell you what you're supposed to do, which means that basically fun. Right? <laughs> um, so that's just how the social works. So I've also done some work over the last couple of years on practices, where the idea is simply to demonstrate that you have to do this, 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 and that, and that, and that way. And that has been particularly nice for my work on different ministries and, you know, understanding what is going on. It's the oldest saw in the bureaucratic studies book that you have standard operational procedures, you have ways of doing things like this. And I've found that if you study that in terms of practices, you get a good handle on it, particularly on what the Frankfurt school, the school would call invariance-breaking behavior, which means doing something else. Right? So let's just stop there.